Thank you. Hi, everybody. Let me introduce the folks here. We've got um, Stacy Bishop from Scale. We've got uh, Renata Quintilli from uh, uh, from Felicis. We got um, Alex Rosen from IDG Ventures and Dave Fowler from Chart.io. Why don't you guys introduce yourselves? Give a quick overview. Yeah. Uh, hi, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm Renata Quintini with Felices Ventures. Uh, the fund, the company was started in 2006. Uh, we're based out of Palo Alto. Today, we have about 110 million dollars under management, and quite simply, our mission is to back uh, the iconic companies of today and tomorrow. And what it means in practical terms is, uh, we don't care where, where the companies are located. Uh, we are stage agnostic, and we're just looking to partner with uh, amazing founders and and be in areas that we're extremely bullish about. Uh, a few companies that we're invested in that you might have heard of, uh, Angry Birds, Shopify, Practice Fusion, baby.com.br, Inkling, and, and a few others, and I'm super psyched to be here. Hi there, I'm Stacy Bishop with Scale Venture Partners. Uh, we broadly have about a billion under management. Um, we invest in mostly SaaS uh, application companies and cloud infrastructure. Um, companies and we're kind of looking for that company early in revenue, maybe a $1 million run rate, you know, all the way up to the late stage that are kind of really looking to sort of either build sales and marketing or users or whatever the metrics are for growth. Um, and uh, some of our investments include Box, DocuSign, Exact Target, HubSpot, Ring Central, so are, are just to name a few. I'm Alex Rosen with IDG Ventures. IDG has been around for about 20 years, investing in technology companies and enterprise and consumer space. We're affiliated with a large media company, but we're an independent venture firm, invest primarily in Series A and uh, seed financings. Uh, our current fund is a $100 million fund. We have 35 companies, roughly split half and half between consumer and enterprise. I've personally been investing in venture for 18 years with two other firms before this. Uh, some of the better known companies that IDG has backed in the first wave of uh, technology innovation was Netscape, Excite, InfraSeq. Um, in our current portfolio, we have a handful of companies like Minted, Smartlang, uh, gaming company Funzio, uh, and a handful of others. Hopefully, it'll be household names soon. Uh, hi, I'm Dave Fowler. I'm the founder of Chartio. We are a SaaS infrastructure company in the early revenue stages. <laughs> uh, uh, and, uh, Should we switch seats? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, we, uh, uh, we basically uh, connect to your database and do uh, charting and dashboarding of your analytics. So whatever data is in your database, you need to see what's going on. Uh, we make it really easy to pull that out. We're in, we're in a space called the Cloud Business Intelligence space. So, Thanks. So let me kind of set the theory of the, of the case. Um, we, had a great, we, we had a great talk from, um, from Mike about thunder lizards. And so the question really is, when you get through the, the generalities that drive the really big deals, what's a venture person to do? How do we really sort out one deal from the other, which, which have the potential to be those big thunder lizards versus, versus not? And so I thought we'd, we'd try to orient the panel around that general question and hopefully, in the meantime, not only talk about how, how they think about this, but have them give good examples of, um, of you know, good specific examples uh, making out the case. So to start, I want to ask the panel, in the first place, do we all agree that we're in a period of really major innovation that, that is a big deal, or is this just all about you know, um, um, mobile game apps and so forth? And I thought we could see how they would argue amongst themselves about this. Uh, I guess as far as predicting a uh, the a thunder lizard. I'm like probably the worst person to ask. Uh, uh, one, I'm not a venture capitalist, but also um, when I started Chartio, I was actually living uh, with the Pinterest founders. They're two of my best friends, and uh, you know they were starting Pinterest. It didn't look like it would be that great, uh, and they were like, Dave, Dave, come work with us. And I was like, No, I think I'm going to start my own thing. And, uh, you know, and I, so I kind of like, it was awesome. We shared an office space for the first year and a half of Pinterest. I saw them like explode and they're huge now. Uh, and it's great. And I, I didn't see it. Um, so I, I missed that, I guess. But I, I'm totally glad I did what I did and, and, and whatnot. But uh, uh, I just, it, <laughs> I, I, I just, you know, 
I, I think it's, it's, it's great to talk about. Yes, there are uh, these great companies coming out. There's like one great one a year and it's worth more than the others. But I think as far as like the recognizing that, that's really hard. Uh, you should keep looking at it and, and, and trying to figure out like what are the predictors of that. And, and, and that's also a great way to improve business and figure out like, and, and teaching other people like how to run your business because model after the greats. But I also, uh, personally, I, I find it really hard to, uh, to predict. Well, I think to add to that, one thing that we try to do as a firm is we look at what we call megatrends, and basically these are things happening in the market, you know, whether it be the proliferation of mobile devices or the fact of, you know, just everything's moving towards the cloud, just a number of these trends, and try to look and see, when we look at a given investment, we say, what are the trends behind it? I mean, I think one, you know, we don't focus as much on consumer, but we've talked about this with Facebook, is that or even social networking in general, is why did it take until 2004 or even 2003 to start to take off? And one of the things is just people had to have a digital photo of themselves to upload, and then secondly, it had to be pretty quick to upload a photo, and it took until about that time for that to happen. And so we constantly ask ourselves, now of course we didn't know that at the time and didn't think of it, so we didn't invest in Facebook, but if that's what we try to do and make ourselves better at is look at the trends behind something and even look at something where there might be an anti-trend against it, where it's just, they're going up against a trend and we think that that could be a challenge. And that's what we try to always do with every investment decision we make and we hope it points us in the right direction, but obviously we all, we do miss things. Yeah, and, um, so the way that we try to rationalize things at, at our firm is to not only have trends, but to have bigger areas that we focus on. So for a while, um, you know, mobile has been a pretty big one, and we thought, okay, what's hot within mobile? What do people do in a mobile phone? Oh, they play games, they talk to each other, and they read news. So we try to find, okay, who are the winning of all these different trends? And that's how we found Angry Birds. Uh, roughly three years ago. And what are we psyched about right now? When we see the, the convergence of uh, faster and faster, not only computing power, but the development of, of hardware technology, uh, better sensors, um, you know, just better storage, smaller batteries, all of these things kind of coming together, the speed of innovation and cycles on the hardware side going down to 12 to 18 months, we have new things in the market. You couple that with just better distribution channels. Uh, now companies like Kness can really go direct to the consumer, establish a relationship with the consumer, and even before creating a product, have a demand pretty sorted out beforehand. So things like a, a Kickstarter, an Indiegogo, and bringing all these things together, uh, we at Felices were calling it investing in science fiction. Uh, we're looking at new computer interfaces, right? Uh, not only gesture um, uh, ways to in interact with a computer, but we're even seeing companies now that are doing mind interaction with computers. Uh, drones, robotics, uh, the convergence of software and bioinformatics, uh, just you know, personalized medicine and being able to do uh, genetic testing. Um, in the womb, non-invasive, accessible to consumers, all of that stuff is either already available or around the corner. Uh, and these are the things that we're really paying attention to now. Um, we, of course, we have an anti-portfolio. We look at things that we pass and we kick ourselves like t tons of times. Um, and we try to learn from these things and we're never gonna get everything right. Um, but I think being aware of your biases is so important as an investor, right? So why, and I actually pay attention a lot to the things that I don't get. Sometimes when something bothers me so much that I don't get, Maybe because I'm not the target customer. So we always try to think that we're the target customer for everything, and we try to, you know, uh, expand our thought process to everything that we see. But when something comes, I would never get a Snapchat ever. <laughs> I still don't. Um, but you know, if that was an area that we were bullish about, being uncomfortable about that would actually make me go and talk to people who use it. And why do you care about it? We didn't invest in Pinterest. We were actually really intrigued about Pinterest. I would spend hours on Pinterest, not know why. <laughs> that should have said something to me uh, as an investor. But that, because I wasn't comfortable with that feeling, I wasn't sort of comfortable pulling the plug, so uh, uh, you know, making that call. So over time, just getting more comfortable with that uncomfortableness is 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 important to be an investor. So, and also associating with thought leaders in the segment. So when things super cutting edge 
try to find people who know more than you do. When an investor knows more than a founder, it's probably not a really good situation to begin with. And we try to get smart on these, uh, these new areas that we're super psyched about. Well, a lot of great comments, so I'll, I'll make one short. I think that looking for thunder lizards is a, a great um, occupation. I think that venture in general is an incredibly humbling experience, and my anti-portfolio is really distinguished. And uh, <laughs> I hope that in another 18 years, I'll, I'll get shorter, um, and the portfolio that I do have will get uh, better, but it's a, it's a great um, it's a great learning experience and it's a very humbling one. Mm -hmm. I think to, uh, to Richard's question about, you know, I was living in a period of great innovation. The way that I thought about is trying to compare sort of the last, you know, 20, 25 years of being exposed to technology and working with technology companies. And to me personally, it feels like where we're sitting now is actually the most rapid pace of innovation that I've seen because I'm seeing it both on the consumer side and the enterprise side at the same time. So I'm seeing a lot of interesting opportunities for small companies and therefore for investors to back those companies, whether it's within e-commerce, whether it's in gaming, whether it's mobile applications, whether it's on the enterprise side. Um, and in particular, I think this trend of consumerization of um, IT within the enterprise is really important and that's, that's a mega trend that is creating massive companies um, that kind of we are very excited about. Yeah, I actually like to see the panel expand on that a bit. I mean, one of the one of the areas of interest at uh, at Bullpen is the trend in B2B, and and we used to think about B2B in a quite simple way, but I think now it's become enormously complex because what's happening is corporations are having to take and extend their 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 scope of analyzing data from what used to be just transaction data out of the ERP system to include every form of data from social, mobile, web, uh, local. Uh, geographic data and so forth. So I think it would be interesting to hear the panel talk specifically about what they see the trends in B2B are, what are the, what are the good opportunities and so forth. And Dave, maybe given you're a B2B company, you could start us off. Yeah, that's kind of what we do. And uh, I'll, I'll just, like, my opinion is exactly what my company's doing. And, and, it, and it's that it's not so much about the size of the data. It's not so much about uh, the crazy distribution of it, it it's, it's more about uh, getting it in the hands of more people and, and I think the, the world is going to become a lot more data literate, uh, dealing with data, analyzing it, uh, taking action off it, uh, finding it, querying it uh, is something that's becoming part of everybody's job. It's not just um, the engineers anymore, like people in marketing are obviously very data driven now, people in sales are also very data driven. It's becoming a part of everyone's job and I think um, we talk about like this huge need of data scientists uh, in the world today. Like there's there's this job shortage for data scientists. I'm trying to hire one right now, and uh, like nobody really has that job title. Uh, it's it's kind of a fictitious uh, job with with a lot of different uh, weird meanings to it, and it's kind of equivalent to um, I just published an article about this uh, yesterday. Uh, Twenty years ago, the IT guy that kind of when we were becoming computer literate uh, as 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 a world. Um, we, we needed this IT guy to like help us figure out how to email people and help us figure out how to restart our machine when it when things broke. Uh, and right now, that's the data scientist. He's like the the guy kind of bringing us into that stage where where eventually we'll all like deal with data every day uh, in our jobs and in our lives. Um, and so I, I see that as being like the next uh, trend uh, over the next 20 years is is just as you need to know how to use your computer in your job in the future, uh, you'll be very dependent on data. I think one thing I'd like to add on the B2B side that we're seeing is I think this is where consumer has significantly impacted B2B and that's uh -huh. that consumer in, uh, apps are you know fun to use, easy to use, anybody can use them, they're super simple. Now that's setting the bar for enterprise and because people can kind of speak with their feet in terms of now download an app that they can use for business just on their iPhone and start using it, it can start to proliferate within the enterprise. But they're choosing based on what the app is and its UI and if it's beautiful and easy and simple and that's just critical and so that's just totally set the bar. It's no longer just push it onto a company and hope they use it and you can even argue with the first generation SaaS companies, they were basically what the licensed companies were but just SaaS, now you can get to it over the cloud. Now we're seeing the next generation where they look like consumer companies and they're even going to market with more of a consumer strategy. It still may be bought by the CFO or bought by the IT person, but it can proliferate and spread within an enterprise before it even gets to that point. Well, and it has also huge implications in the business model and, and how these companies 
get capitalized and grow over time, right? And how they price their product and, and whatnot. Right, right. The, the part that I'm seeing that's true both on the enterprise side and the consumer, but particularly on the enterprise to your question, is the fact that companies are going global and multinational and multilingual much earlier in their stage of development than they used to. It used to be that you got to a certain sense and maybe you had you know, a couple of people in Europe and you know, having an office in London was your international strategy. And now you're seeing the proliferation of mobile and truly kind of cloud-based delivery where you're gonna end up having customers all over the globe um, before you know it, I bet you guys have you know customers everywhere. Oh yeah. And, wait, you're not supposed to disagree, right? Oh, sorry. <laughs> no, we don't. <laughs> and I think that uh, thinking about your customers as not just being your geography, not just those the ones you can you know take a box of donuts to and have a, and close a sale kind of the old-fashioned way, but actually having them in multiple time zones is making people think about businesses you know a very different way. With that, like different people are making the decisions uh, in the company. It's um, I have, a, I have a number of friends who work at Splunk that just IPO'd, and their whole model was, you know, it was free to use, and the IT people would install it, 5,000, you, you would get uh, 5,000 log entries, you get a certain amount of size that it could work for, and then um, as soon as you got it past that, you, you'd have to start paying. So these people would install it for free, these IT people, and then all of a sudden, their manager would see it, or, oh, that's really cool, and that's really cool, and it, it kind of the land and expand model is what it is called, and uh, that that sales model is very different than you know the steaks, uh, steak dinners that you take out, uh, the the CEO and the CFO uh, and CIO, so very different sales model. Well, along those lines, I mean, um, from kind of a little bit of in, inside the baseball VC stuff, the the <clears throat> the evaluation of a deal. In the, in the early days of, uh, of the consumerization of everything, just for direct consumer applications, we, we, we wondered about virality and we figured out how to make this stuff get into the marketplace with very, very little selling costs and so forth. And now we're talking about B2B sales. Are we gonna slide back to the old model of direct selling in the B2B world? Is it gonna slow down things? How do you evaluate a B2B deal versus a consumer deal along, along the kind of business model realities that each each face in their own different ways. Well, I think in the B2B world, you have to look at what the customers are doing and saying and um, how they're actually paying for the product. But the, maybe the one experience that people are starting to apply from the consumer side to the business side is actually looking at almost an e-commerce metrics of your customer acquisition cost versus the lifetime value of a customer. And particularly in a SaaS world, you can actually calculate those numbers very quickly and very easily. Um, as opposed to kind of a you know traditional enterprise sale, so kind of that application of a consumer metrics, consumer business model to a SaaS world, I think is now something that's you know part of everybody's um, language that certainly wasn't ten years ago. And yeah, oh, go ahead. No, sorry. And, and something that we do uh, for every area that we invest in, but it becomes particularly important when we go super super early and we don't have all the traction data is to do a lot of uh, early customer calls and try to identify how critical that product is really to the customer. And you know, if that product were to go away tomorrow, would your life change? Even if the customer is not paying for it at that time, but if he says, this changed my life, I use it every day, I can't imagine my processes without it, then we know that company is onto something. But if the customer is like, oh, this is a nice to have, it just makes things a lot harder to get b bullish about. And one thing I'll add to the sales process, so you know, we've all heard about the freemium and free trial and just getting it in the hands of customers. So I think the way everything, even in B2B, how software is bought or sold is different. Like, you know, there's statistics out there that 60% of the sales funnel happens before there's any contact with a sales rep, and sometimes it's even more. So, you know, people are doing a lot more research on the web, they're able to try the product, they're able to, you know, do the free trial, whatever it is, do a ton of research, go on customer communities, see reviews, um, and so a lot of that's happening, and so that it's just shortened in some ways the sales cycle or the engagement with the sales rep, because the customer now is so much more knowledgeable than they were, say, 10 years ago about, the alternatives and the product offerings and whatnot today. Chartio, by the way, has a two-week free trial. Uh, you can sign up today. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it makes all the difference. Like all of our competitors, basically, you got you got to call a salesperson and have a WebEx demo with them. Um, and and for us, though, you know, people can get set up in an hour or two uh, versus you know having this long sales process and, and discussing it and 
you know, we basically try to get out of your way if, if that's what you want is to just try it out. Uh, and and yeah, it's it's a, it's a very very different model than than the heavy-handed model. Okay. So, it, it, particularly for for you venture guys, as you look yeah, at guys. your deal flow and and you get ready to take the next meeting, um, what what's your feeling? Are are we seeing um, are we starting to see one deal resembling another more than than say a year or two ago? Are we are are we still seeing continued acceleration and just the cleverness and the and the breadth of of uh, various ideas? How's that how's that looking these days? I think in certain subsectors you can see sort of this frenzy. We saw it, and I'll describe in the social media marketing space, and we had an investment. We knew there were a couple other comp uh, competitors. We made the investment in January 2011, and I felt like every week on VentureWire I read about another one cropping up. And so there was just, you know, probably within the span of a year, this was, you know, timing after the launch of Facebook. Now all of a sudden brands were trying to figure out, well, how do we reach everybody on Facebook? And so, you know, bazillion companies sprouted up, and then there was a wave of acquisitions, and now that's kind of settled down. So I think in subsectors you see this kind of frenzy because of something that happened in the market and then it kind of dies down. So, you know, right now, I don't know, for some reason I'm seeing in the early, st you know, the early kind of onboarding and recruiting phase, there's been a number of companies that have sprung up. Um, and it's, you know, we ask ourselves sort of the why now question, why all of a sudden now are there 10 companies doing this? So mm -hmm. um, I just see it in little subsectors, but not anything more than say two years ago. It's just yeah. in certain sectors it happens. The way that I see it right now is that I think that every successful sector that is showing traction in terms of customers actually using it in the consumer or on the enterprise has a dozen companies, if not more. So there are very, very few. I can actually think of only one company in our portfolio that does not have multiple direct competitors, and I'm counting days until somebody's going to pop up. <laughs> but I think in everywhere, everywhere else I look, there are going to be you know a dozen to two dozen venture funded or even independently funded companies competing for you know the same market if it's a good market. So if if you can if you can do this without giving away trade your trade secrets, of say the last month or two of your deal flow. Um, what what intrigues you the most? Do you have one, is there one thing that stands out where you're saying to yourself, you know, I think this could be a breakthrough kind of a deal and we really need to look at this very carefully? Well, in deal flow or one that we actually invest in? Either way, either way. Just, I'm trying to get a sense, if you can give the audience some sense of, 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 of what really excites you in terms of a space and, and and that's early enough so it's not obvious, but that you're really kind of thinking may, may be one of your breakthrough deals, if, if any exist. So I'll, I'll give two examples, one that we actually invested in, one that we're not investors in. So the one that we're investors in, a company called Expect Labs, um, I think we serve as the next generation of a Siri product. So underneath there is a voice-based, uh, voice recognition uh, um, engine from Dragon, um, from uh, Nuance. And then on top of that, it's actually a search engine that listens to a speech between two people when they know um, they're being listened to, unlike the NSA. Uh, <laughs> and based on the conversation, makes um, search suggestions, anticipating what the next topic of interest may be. So it is definitely, and they're not a science fiction category, but if it works, it is kind of an, uh, a helpful anticipatory assistant um, that'll be helpful um, in lots of areas of business and consumer. So if it works, I think it's gonna be uh, tremendous and, and very significant. One we didn't invest in um, that I still think is super interesting is a company that's actually a competitor uh, to Google Glasses. But unlike the connection between the glasses and your um, mobile device, all the computing is actually done um, in the wearable device. So um, it is uh, it's very clever systems engineering. It's great uh, visual recognition. It's um, great miniaturization. Um, and uh, lots of things have to go right. But if they do, there's going to be a huge company. Um, on the super early side for us, uh, really hard technical problems to solve um, along the lines of science fiction stories we've been spending a lot of time on. Uh, you know, we have a company based out of South San Francisco that 3D prints DNA. Um, and, you know, it, it seems, seems like it's working. It's admittedly over our heads to uh, <laughs> diligence the technology. Uh, but if there's one team in the world that can figure that 
that, that stuff out as them. Um, you know, George Church is one of the, the person, the founding team, and they, these people have been doing this for such a long time. And if they figure it out, the, the thing is so big that it's, it's worth our time to, to take that risk and to learn from that. And even if it fails, these people are gonna try something again in that space, and we're gonna learn from them and, and, and have that, that knowledge and that insight into the network. We invested in a company based out of Canada that's around uh, you know, thought interface with computing. Uh, we invested in a company that does operating systems for drones. Um, and if you think about applications in um, precision agriculture, you know, really finding out where you should plant that, that the, the seed and, and figure out the crop or public security, these things can, can have a pretty, pretty big market. Uh, so these are the things that are really exciting us on the early stage, like the crazy stuff. And when you look at um, more developed companies, uh, we're really interested in security. Um, there's so many mobile phones out there, but there are even more servers out there. Uh, and you know that, that stuff around cyber warfare or enterprise with really big data and how do you transmit all that information and, and how do you protect all that, it's a pretty big problem and we're spending a lot of time in that space. Um, payments on, on a global scale, we, we still think it's a pretty interesting area, but for those things, we're looking at companies that are a little bit further along. Well, I've been, I've been uh, told by the, by the managers of this operation that we have, <laughs> we have to kind of wrap this up, but we have time for one question, one or two questions from the audience for the panel. Yes. In terms of exits, what, what is attractive to you guys when somebody comes to you? Is it the IPO? Is it the billion dollar acquisition? Is it the you know, $30 million early exit? Well, it all depends on when you come in. If you come in for I would take the billion over the 30, yeah. just for the record. <laughs> right. <laughs> but it all depends on, yeah, expectation setting when you come in. But I think, say we're coming into, you know, I'll put maybe a $10 million run rate SaaS company. I think we have to believe it's an IPO-able opportunity. But an M&A can happen in all, along the way, and that's great. But I think we just have to believe that we're going for IPO, and that's what the management's going for. Um, but, you know, m and is kind of a great thing that can happen at any point. Yeah, so the rule of thumb is at least a, you know, a 10x or a venture-like return from the time you come in. Uh, but we're, as long as the founder's happy, we're happy. And that's probably for early stage. I think yeah. you can still see late stage investments where your time horizon's a lot shorter, but you might say, yeah, exactly, three a 3x kind of thing. Yeah. Exactly. If you're coming super early, use a 10x. And then halfway between that for something mid-stage. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, I'd like to thank the panel. Let's give them a nice round of applause. <laughs> <laughs>